The Second Crusade has failed, but its end will open the door to the Plantagenets, that brilliant, avaricious, rebellious, murderous family that will dominate the history of Western Europe for a century to come. Here's their story, so riveting that we still are fascinated by it 900 years later. Welcome back to Lion's Forge. My name is Beckett, and I want to tell you a story, an epic true story of five kings and the Lion Queen. Season 2, Episode 10, Hammers to the English. And so the Clarendon Council was called by the king as 1164 began with a troubling report from an abbot near Paris about a sky dragon furiously burning houses. While it was commonly thought the meeting of nobles and clergy was to witness an argument between king and church over the system for justice in Henry's England, in reality, it would be the beginning of a battle to the death between Henry Plantagenet and his former best friend and closest advisor, Thomas Becket, once chancellor, now Archbishop of Canterbury. Becket himself could not possibly have misjudged his situation. Henry had made his displeasure with Thomas entirely clear at a private meeting where the king pulled Canterbury's richest manners from Becket's control. Pressured by both Pope and King, Thomas reluctantly agreed that he would not oppose the idea of a restatement of relations between the Crown and the Church. If the term Constitutions of Clarendon means anything to us now, at best it's a dim high school memory of something to do with the first definitive separation of Church and State in England. From the perspective of those directly involved in 1164, the Constitutions were to define once and for all what the Church owed to the crown of Henry Plantagenet and what, if anything, the crown owed in return. To us, the Constitutions make rather drab reading. They were the King's creation, speaking to such dull topics as Church elections and the clergy's right to travel. But at that place, in that time, they were riveting. They were written down, a rarity in itself, and written down by noblemen hand-picked by Henry, who said he chose them because they remembered the relevant practices and customs of Henry Beauclerc's reign of thirty-five years before, a time now recalled as so happily free of troublesome problems between church and state. Beauclerc's grandson argued that he himself wished nothing more than to return the kingdom to that pleasantly simple earlier time, when rules just like the ones he was laying out had been widely recognized, readily accepted, indeed welcomed by both statesmen and bishops, if admittedly never written down. This was no trivial matter. Both Anglo-Saxon and Norman law the basis for jurisprudence in Henry Plantagenet's England, focused intently on what had been done in the past, recalled from the living depths of generational memory. A book on legal practice written back in the 11th century stressed that a landowner, who by definition played the role of local judge and jury, should always know what the ancient tradition of the land is. As historian Peter Ackroyd notes, the unanswerable complaint of the laborer or the villager was that, we have never been accustomed to do this. The existing structure of things had at all costs to be protected. Henry was now insisting that all he was doing was having wise men who knew the customs of yesteryear write those customs down. It seems that Henry had initially given Thomas some vague assurance that the written document would be entirely acceptable to the bishops, but when Thomas was confronted with the actual manuscript, his suspicion about what the clergy was being asked to agree to doubled and doubled again. 
there were too many provisions that seemed to have little, if anything, to do with the old ways. When before had the king's consent been required for churchmen to leave England? When had lay courts had so many rights over church matters? Most disturbing. When had lay courts been able to try clergy accused of serious crimes? Pressed hard by Henry and Henry's men, the council turned into a pressure cooker of argument, counter-argument, intimidation, resistance, anger, and outright fear. Exactly what happened in those rooms at Clarendon is still not entirely clear, as the dismayed witnesses wrote very little. We know that men argued, threatened, resisted, agreed, caved, reneged, bargained, wavered. Were you for the king, or were you a rebel? Were the parchment scrolls awaiting signature honest representations of long-standing tradition, or something far more threatening to the independence of the church? What would the bishops do? For three days under intense pressure, Becket insisted that the constitutions were unacceptable, not at all what Henry had so vaguely outlined, but the dam ultimately broke. He finally gave way and directed his bishops to sign. The bishops in turn were almost speechless with shock at his about face. Gilbert Foliot, Bishop of London and never a Becket enthusiast, would later bitterly reproach him as the general of our army who deserted, the captain of our camp who fled. We still don't know what threats, what pressures drove Becket to the edge, but Henry got exactly what he wanted. Specific rules governing much of the church's daily life, with no equivalent limits on his own behavior. Elections to the position of bishop were to take place in the presence of royal officers. Senior clergy couldn't leave the country without royal approval. Clerical felons would be tried in secular courts. It didn't even end there. For the first time, the bishops of England were obliged to swear personal oaths to obey a written royal mandate. It was a profound capitulation on Thomas's behalf. Even Henry's admiring biographer W. L. Warren admits that the constitutions were indeed royal interference with ecclesiastical authority. The limitations on the clergy were precisely defined, but the principles which were to govern the king in turn were not. It was a frightful crack in the church's eternal walls, and Thomas had helped swing the hammer. Thus the legendary battle between Henry II, the King of England, and Thomas Becket, the Archbishop of Canterbury, was truly joined, a battle that would end six years later with Becket's murder in front of the altar of Canterbury Cathedral. As soon as Thomas left the bitter place where he had been broken, he was flayed by regret, imposing his own penances on himself, including the worst, self-imposed abstention from celebrating Mass. Nor were his critics limited to the voices in his own head. His entire career had been one that spawned jealous rivals, and triumphant Henry, with a list of Becket's perceived transgressions against the royal will firmly in hand, was more than a little inclined to listen. After a spring and summer of constant tension, things came to a head as they inevitably would. The spark was a petty legal matter. A nobleman and royal officer named John Fitzgilbert complained that he had not received justice in the archbishop's court in the matter of his claim to some property. Henry took up Fitzgilbert's little case with remarkably keen interest, issuing a writ that ordered Thomas to appear personally in Henry's presence to explain. Archbishops were not normally summoned to the king's court in the first place, but when Thomas, pleading illness, sent several of his knights as his delegates, Henry exploded. Becket was ordered to appear before a royal council set for October, 
this one at Northampton, to answer the king's charge of contempt of court. Henry's icy fury was evident in the form of the summons. Rather than writing, The King to Thomas, Archbishop of Canterbury, greetings, as common courtesy would have it, the local sheriff was told to bring Becket in. It was the first time in English history that such a man had been treated in such a way. Tuesday, October 6th, came all too soon. Virtually every man of importance in the kingdom was in attendance, although Henry pointedly arrived insultingly late, having deliberately stopped to hawk along the way. Thomas and his retinue found their promised lodgings occupied by the king's people. The archbishop left to scrounge up whatever rooms he could. At their first meeting, Thomas offered the customary kiss of peace, that established and very public medieval rite that marked the true state of a personal relationship. Henry turned aside. Everyone who saw it gasped. This would indeed be very bad. Thomas was not above his own imperial gestures. He ostentatiously carried the huge silver cross of the Archbishop of Canterbury into the assembly with his own hands, publicly invoking God's protection against the King of England, while silently threatening King and Kingdom with excommunication and interdict. At Mass, he reached into the liturgy for the Christmas season to find the line, Princes sat and spoke against me, a verse hardly designed to soften Henry's mood. The outcome of the Northampton hearing was as predictable as sunset, even if it took several days to play out. Charge after charge against the archbishop was read aloud in that chilly hall filled with murmuring bishops and barons, his failure to obey the royal summons in the Fitzgilbert case was merely the opening bid, one which by itself carried the breathtaking sentence of forfeiture of everything he owned. One of the richest men in England literally became destitute in the space of a few hours. Next was the shocking accusation that he had embezzled three hundred pounds while serving as chancellor. Thomas had held that post for eight years. Now, with no notice, he was to account for every farthing that had passed through his hands during those busy times. Even that was topped by the accusation that he had failed to repay the king's treasury a thousand gold pieces used in the course of the Toulouse campaign, waged, after all, on the king's behalf. All told, Thomas was held to owe the government tens of thousands of pounds in repayments, fines, and forfeitures. He would never be able to pay it. No one except the king himself could have paid it. To his credit, Becket got himself under control and deftly played defense, responding that he had come to Northampton to answer charges about the Fitzgilbert claim, nothing else. Further, Fitzgilbert wasn't present. Without the accuser at hand, there could be no trial. Without a trial, there could be no judgment. He reminded his listeners that when he resigned his position as Chancellor, he had been given a release from all liability. Further, regardless of the constitutions of Clarendon, he would appeal any injustice in the Northampton Court's findings to Rome. No one doubts today, and probably few doubted then, that at Northampton, Henry simply tossed aside two hundred years of English common law. Becket was told, or so we believe, that nothing but the resignation of his position and his acceptance of the loss of his estates would save his life. As for his position as the chief prelate to the Roman Catholic faith in England, that had been entirely undermined. Everyone in Becket's presence was frightened near to death. Once an enemy, Henry could not be deflected and could not be stopped. Barons, government officers, and churchmen swarmed between the two sides, carrying messages, giving advice, 
interpreting events with self-interest ever paramount. Bishops who longed above all to extricate themselves and their estates turned tail. England even buzzed with speculation that the grievously angry king intended to load on the criminal charge of treason, punishable by death, because Thomas's petition of appeal to Rome openly defied the constitutions of Clarendon. Once it was over and Thomas had fled from England to save his life, another violation of the constitutions, Henry wrote a letter to Louis Capet. We still have a copy of it. It reads, You should know that Thomas, who was Archbishop of Canterbury, has been publicly judged in my court by the full council of the barons of my realm as a wicked and perjured traitor. I earnestly beg you not to allow a man guilty of such infamous crimes and treasons to remain in your kingdom. And let not this great enemy of mine have any counsel or aid from you. Rather, if you please, help me to take vengeance on my great enemy. Decades before, another Archbishop of Canterbury had hastily left England after a quarrel with Henry's grandfather, Henry Beauclerc. But that exile had been quite civil, ending relatively quickly with little harm to either side. This time, a prince of the church had been deposed in a manner that many participants had to privately assess a vengeful farce. Not all were silent in the matter. A few brave souls put themselves and their estates at risk by offering to stand at Becket's sureties for at least some of the immense fines levied against him. As for the pious king of France, Louis Capet was said to be incredulous that any king could think himself in a position to judge an archbishop. Henry, though, was quite untroubled by any such scruples. As far as he was concerned, things were going delightfully well. He had just rid himself of his meddlesome priest, helping himself to a fortune in the process. He even had the opportunity to hurt his former best friend again. He summarily banished everyone even tenuously related to Becket, some of them simple clerks who had done nothing but work in Becket's office. Four hundred people roused from their homes to be herded and bullied into boats, forced to leave England in winter with nothing but the clothes they wore. The crown then naturally seized all of their assets. The king was feeling so jovial that Eleanor was pregnant again. The Plantagenets even shrugged off news that the Capetians had reinforced their ties to the powerful house of Blois. Eleanor's two daughters with Louis, Marie and Alex, now aged nineteen and thirteen, were married off to the Blois brothers, respectively the Count of Champagne and the Count of Blois. Henry had substantial counterweight of his own, a dashing German nobleman known as the Lion of Saxony. The German, whose given name was also Henry, was being pulled into the Plantagenet's gravitational field thanks to the need to find a mate for eight-year-old Matilda, the oldest Plantagenet daughter. This wasn't little Matilda's first experience with dynastic matchmaking. A few years earlier, back when Louis Capet's second wife was about to give birth, Henry had trotted baby Matilda to Normandy so that he might offer her to the newborn Capetian heir should there be one. Since there had not, the princess was still unbetrothed. Henry ignored possible matches among the English, French, Iberian, Sicilian, Byzantine, Russian, and Flemish nobility, instead turning to the Germans as his grandfather had done in marrying his own little Matilda to the German imperial heir decades before. Henry's favor toward the Germans was, of course, calculated. It was pleasantly worrisome to both Louis Capet and to the Pope, the harried Alexander III. The French king and the Pope had offered their support to the fugitive Thomas Becket, a refugee now resident in Louis's lands. The French king and the pope accordingly had to be made to feel Henry's power ruffling along their borders. Germany's lion, Henry, Duke of Bavaria and Saxony, 
was an interesting choice as the husband for an eight-year-old girl. The suitor was older than Henry Plantagenet by a few years, and had been long married to a German princess, with whom he had two daughters. His lineage was faultless. His family had been powerful for the better part of the past three centuries, controlling a significant part of what is now modern Germany along with a chunk of Italy. They were even contenders, if unsuccessful ones, for the title of Holy Roman Emperor. The lion himself had been determined and clever enough to regain huge territories taken away from his family after one such failed run at the imperial throne. He was a busy, intelligent man, interested in all the issues of the day, from religion to urbanism. Nor was he indifferent to art and manufacturing. The courtyard of his castle boasted the first bronze statue north of Rome, a magnificent lion. Our German lion had come back on the marriage market fairly recently, having caved to pressure from his cousin Frederick Barbarossa, the current Holy Roman Emperor. Rather late in the day, or so one might think, Frederick found himself displeased at the way the lion's wife's territory intruded into his own lands. Accordingly, said wife was let go, and the newly unwed duke turned his face toward the confident and powerful Henry Plantagenet. Envoys came and went across the channel, Henry Plantagenet meeting a delegation from the emperor in Rouen, while Eleanor received the archbishop of Cologne. The pregnant queen was probably in a fine mood. Becket, never a favorite of hers, was gone. She was again d'accord with her volatile husband, who favored her enough to name her regent in his home country of Anjou. Her eldest girl was on the verge of making a fine match, while toddler Eleanor cut her baby teeth and scooted down the hallway with her dolls. The boys, young Henry, Richard, and Geoffrey, now aged ten, eight, and seven, were healthy and safe. Happily responsible for the governance of Anjou, Eleanor established her summer court at Angers, the fine old city along the banks of the River Main, protected by a massive wall boasting seventeen defensive towers, and crowned by a cathedral where the devout could pray before the very head of John the Baptist. The Angevin countryside was lovely, fresh, and lush under the summer sun. But the delectable summer of Anno Domini 1165 did not last. There were comets in the English sky that August, celestial omens of trouble. The year that had started with such promise splintered in Henry's hands as he limped back from a nasty fight in Wales. All the news was suddenly bad. There were rustlings of rebellion against Plantagenet rule in the Aquitaine, where Angoulême and La Marche, key provinces, were rumored ready to switch their unsteady allegiance to France. Thomas Becket wrote blistering letters from exile that made their way to virtually every pulpit in Western Europe. And gossip was being spooned up like honey on the tongue that Eleanor was entertaining herself along the banks of the Maine in the intimate company of an Aquitanian relative and member of her court, one Rolf de Fay. But the truly incredible story of the day came about this way. The chronicler Gerald of Wales was a student in Paris at the time, and never forgot that sweltering Sunday night when every church bell in the city suddenly began ringing wildly. He thought there must have been a terrible fire in some quarter of the city, and called down to a woman running past. There is born in Paris tonight a king who will be a hammer to the English, she shouted up at him. After 28 years on the French throne and three wives, Louis Capet had finally produced the next king of France. We've come to the end of our story for the time being. I am Beckett Arnold, narrating from the book Lion's Forge, adapted for us by the author Karen Markle Knapp. Thank you to Francis Butt for voicing our introduction. 
If you like what you hear, please give us a rating, follow our channel, and share us with your friends. Most importantly, please join us again April 15th for the next episode of Lion's Forge, available everywhere you get your favorite podcasts, including on YouTube with video episode trailers. Visit us on Facebook, where you can ask questions, leave reviews, and interact with me. Until next time, thank you for listening.